We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrevix. Joining me today is David Murren, global forecaster and author of Breaking the Code of History, Lions Led by Lions, and Red Lightning. Thanks for joining me today, David. How are you? Great to be back on my favorite show, Tom. <laughs> oh, come on. Your favorite show, David? I always love being squeezed by you. <laughs> David, it's always interesting to speak with you because you have such a, let's say, a, a cyclical view on much of the activities and situations that we're reading about we're, we're so focused on in the world today you know one of the one of the the i think the great analogies that you used in our pre pre-recorded conversation here today was the idea that there are almost rail tracks that lead to a lot of these conflicts that we're now facing in the world you know it is the the idea that there are cycles that play out that inevitably really lead to a lot of these conflicts. So why don't we start talking, kind of separating out the particular war zones that the world is so focused on today. And then from there, we can kind of get into the markets and, and ideas like that. So why don't we start by talking about something that you and I have touched on quite a bit is the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Okay. And maybe just for a second, go back a second. Because mm -hmm. having talked about cycles, the question is, what are the big cycles at play at the moment which are driving this process? And I should say that from the moment I understood a thing called the Kondratiev cycle that started again in 2000 and 2002, I first of all went to the thought that the conclusion of that cycle in 2025 to 26 would be the most significant war we've seen. Mm -hmm. Because if you believe in the cycles, you pick them up, you know that that peak brings with it huge change. So my work has been about tracking two things. One is the way that cycle operates, which then feeds through to commodities, which we'll talk about, but then the bigger cycle of empires and hegemonic challenge. And the best way I can describe it now is every two cycles, if you go back to 1914, and then you go back to the First World War, that was a hegemonic challenge mm -hmm. between Germany and Britain for global power. And interesting enough, you could argue that the Germans were far more autocratic under the Second Reich with the Kaiser than Britain and France's version of how to rule. So already you can see democracy, autocracy. You can see that Britain was a sea power, which is very much something which I think that democracy's origins come from. And Germany was a land power, more populous, more hierarchical. And funny enough, if you go back another 110 years, you can see the Napoleonic Wars starting in 1799 with Napoleon being exactly that character, autocratic, mm -hmm. and also a freer, more individualized Europe continent that took 16 years to basically bring him to Brook and end it. So that's two hegemonic cycles, and we're now in the third of those. There are cycles going back further, but they're the most relevant to our understanding. And we're now in another cycle, and that cycle is personified by autocracy led by the center of China. None of this would be happening if China wasn't reaching a point of parity with America and challenge, because all the smaller agencies only are bold enough to act, Russia, Iran, because there's a big person behind them, making their challenge and slowly in hurling people into the fray. Mm -hmm. And that's our context. We've got this hegemonic challenge of China. We've got this contractive cycle which is coming into its terminal phase, which is, I would describe, not just about inflation, that's the byproduct of it. It's really an entropic cycle. And I have this whole concept of civilization being anti-entropic. And when an empire is at its peak, it's the most anti-entropic. And then as it starts to decline, it creates a vacuum. A new system rises into it. And we use war to knock the weaker system off and replace it with a stronger system. Mm -hmm. So wars are basically our Darwinistic process of natural selection. And we're here because every time something reached a peak, another system challenged it as it declined and replaced it with something stronger. So the first lesson is, War has never been banished. We didn't become more civilized. We just had a pause long enough to see, as other people have, the gaps between great hegemonic struggles are 110 years or so between starts. Mm -hmm. And we just fell into the gap of thinking that we were different. We're not. 
that's the first thing. once you realize war is inevitable because we don't realize it is because we don't realize it's integral to our evo evolution that's when you start to change everything and you see it differently so what this is essentially is china's challenge to america and the agglomeration of another autocracy in terms of russia and iran and north korea and they all sit in satellite status the first act of aggression i would argue was the release of the pandemic which was intentional whether it was intentional at the lab or intentionally weaponized it was an intentional act that clearly showed hostility on behalf of china to debilitate the West. Big tick. It's a little bit like observation, by the way, because anyone who does reconnaissance on you is not being benign. They're doing it for hostile intent. And that's the other thing we've seen with spying before that and the extraction of IP. Everything is highly hostile. China's been hostile to us for 20 years, yet we built their industrial base thinking we would get rich on it. How stupid are, are we? Another sign of this building momentum. So that, going back to your question, where are we in Ukraine conflict? In a pretty dire place, if I'm really you know, honest. A dire place because the stalemate, which I really term the bloody stalemate, because it's brutal, is an exact product of the vision of Biden and Jake Sullivan, who decided in their infinite diswisdom that basically rather than confronting Putin and knocking him back, which could have actually stopped the chain of events, which are, we're now accelerating more and more into and shown strength. But the trouble is that Putin used a policy of deterrence and he used the threat of all out nuclear war to turn Biden into a Pavlov's dog, responding desperately to do anything but blow the world up. He never realized that Putin wouldn't do it, but he got intimidated in the playground and he lived with this Pavlov's concept that you can never ever go that far. So that means we can't beat Russia. All we can do is a treat it, we can grind it down, hope there's going to be regime change, and that's the, the best way to get through this. So what's happened? The Ukrainians have expended the most horrendous loss of life. To be fair, there are many Russians who didn't want to fight who've died, which is a horrendous thing. To, it's not just one side, and it's horrendous loss of life. And Putin had a putsch, and he's stronger than ever, and there's no way he's going to be deposed. He controls the system totally. Wake up world. He's not going to be shaken out of his tree. He's well and truly embedded in his tree. He's embedded, and his strategy is very different from ours. It's the perception he may not be able to win on the battlefield outright now, but he can outlive us and outfight us to the point where the winds of change come in America, the funding stops, and he wins his war. And we've given him all those lovely bones to make him think he can get away with it, rather than providing the weapon systems to win a conflict. And in looking at the, the whole summer offensive, the Ukrainians really have used what they've been given in a very effective way. But they have a huge problem. Twofold, there's, there's three things that are different about this. Is one, everything you do on the battlefield is seen by drones or reconnaissance systems, which means concentration and breaking through is a challenge. It's a new challenge. But if you were facing NATO, that challenge would be overcome by air power. And in history, there is no combined arms operation that succeeded without air dominance. So asking the Ukrainians to do it without air dominance or even air neutrality at the beginning because they couldn't defend their, their, their attacking moments from Russian K-52 helicopter, K helicopters is just, it's rude to ask them to do that. It was rude. It was arrogant. And then to see the Germans saying, you're not doing what you should do. Again, it's just, we've lost the plot. We lost it. And I think we betrayed Ukraine fundamentally. Biden and Sullivan betrayed them. And they now face it in a position where we either give them what they need or we're about to run of ammunition with the Russian stocks being greater for, for their artillery shells. Now they've got them from North Korea. The European program of I promise you a million and I make 300,000 doesn't look good. And the problem now is that some of those shells that were coming out of Israel are being called back to Israel because of Israel's activities. So as far as Putin's concerned, this is an amazing moment. He's fended off the, the whole offensive. He's sold the concept to the West through infiltration and action that this is an unwinnable war. And now you're seeing areas, you know, the Republican Trumpites, and let's face it, Trump and, and Putin had an unnatural covert relationship of some kind that never made sense if you look at their actions, apart from there was some level of control influence. And now you've got Trumpites in the House blocking or trying to block the funding, and they look like they are blocking the funding. 
And the only way around that, if they manage to do that, is Europe substitutes, raises the money, and pays America for weapons that then go out. And I think that may well be the only way this process might resolve itself if the House can't be cleared with its blockage. And that doesn't look very optimistic. So Putin is sleeping really well right now. And, you know, we've lost. We failed to punish him decisively. And what's crazy is we had the weapon systems and capability to wipe him out. You know, when, when, when the head of the Ukrainian armed forces says we need a technological leap forwards, it's not that it doesn't exist. It just exists in NATO. We just didn't give it to him. So is and this that, almost the really the, the idea of playground psychology at work here we should have you know really acted aggressively at the beginning to show not only putin but the world that there are consequences for actions of aggression like that absolutely and we were joking before am i if i you know perhaps i can use the same analogy but it basically it, it, it to everyone everyone has the knowledge of this process mm -hmm. they just think it exists in your playground past but, you know, if someone was taking, making jokes and taking the fun out of you, and I was rude and talked about your lack of hair, and every day they made a joke, <laughs> and day one they made a joke, and you were hair, and nothing happened. And day two mm -hmm. they made a joke, nothing happened. And day three and day four, they were emboldened, it got more aggressive. One day's rubbing sandpaper on your head. It's all very ugly. Mm -hmm. Option two is, hey, buddy, can you give me three calls here? That was strike one. By strike three, you'll be on your back flat, unconscious, your choice. Mm -hmm. Second time, sorry, buddy, second strike. Third strike, instantly unconscious. Neither does he not do it. No one does it. Mm -hmm. And and predators and dictators are one and the same. And they take advantage of simple, fearful people. And Biden is fearful, and he is linearly simple in his an analysis of the world, this was never accurate, even when he was at his best. But his geriatric form is diabolically. It's like sort of playing a game in a world that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing. And Jake Sullivan, so-called the sort of the bright star in the White House, is just not up to the job. Everything he touches is a linear disaster because he doesn't have any strategic vision or foresight with lateral thinking. And engagements of challenge are lateral. They're not linear. They don't play the game according to how America likes to play the game. They find your weakness and they burrow underneath the ground. Mm -hmm. quite literally in the case of Hamas. So we've got the worst leadership. It's weak. You know, its history is never, ever called the COVID epidemic. I think you know, I've got my own reasons for that. I think it's, it was a, an, an, an intelligence operation that compromised America as they tried to find out more about the PLA program. They're embarrassed, so they never called it. And you've got this route from Afghanistan, which is just terrifying. And we sold out our allies, you know, or America did in the process. Huge incompetence. You've got the failure to see an invasion coming and take him inside and warn him the way we just described, hey, Mr. Putin, three strikes. And by the way, did you know that Ukraine's a member of NATO as of yesterday? So off you go. What do you want to do? I mean, the way the way forward, what could you have done in that, in that process? You could have done something that no one ever thought, which was let Ukraine into NATO in the most secret negotiations ever and said, now it's a member of NATO, call a bluff. Mm -hmm. But we didn't do that and we didn't support them. And if it wasn't for Boris Johnson, the speed of the White House's response would have left Ukraine overwhelmed. Johnson single-handedly pulled the White House in and changed the face of that battle. Mm -hmm. He did everything else he touched poorly, but that one thing was brilliant and game-changing. Now he didn't do it just through vision, he did because he was desperate politically, but nonetheless, he did it. And he deserves credit for that because it was massive. But right but, now, go ahead, David. Just yeah. finish finish that thought there. Right now, we've got a situation where Putin's architecture of this is an unwinnable war. You can't go forwards. Do you want to do this anymore? The only way to get through this is let me win. Basically, that's the narrative. And mm -hmm. Biden and, and and Sullivan have reinforced it. And then that gave him time. I'm convinced a link between Russia and Iran. Because let's look at it, Iran is providing weapons to the war with Russia. That means there's a conversational route. That meant there could be, could you do something down south? Would you mind? I mean, that's how the world really works. The thing mm -hmm. that didn't happen is madness. So you can now see the link between Russia and Iran. And imagine if we closed Russia out, this wouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. So now you've got escalation flowing into another hot zone. 
And one of the things that happens in these Chondratius peaks is as the entropy surges across the human system, the fractures between nations become greater, leading to conflict, and the fractures within nations become greater. And one of the things interesting in World War I, as you move in, British society and German society were pretty homogeneous. So the idea you saw of marches in the streets against the government didn't happen. But because we've had and now got fully integrated societies with minorities that have completely different views from the country they're in, we are now seeing those fracture points flare up. And that's really important point is that we've got to get control of it because it weakens us. Mm -hmm. We have to get our house in order and we have to have a, dare I say, a party line of relative behavior, which doesn't fit with democracy. But in wartime, that's exactly what you do. You have to create a degree of coherence. Mm -hmm. And having these 100,000 marches from Palestinians and the police not daring to respond because there's too many of them, that doesn't work at all. So we need to get a house in order as a woke, broken, liberal Western world so we can then present more strength in trying to cope with the outside problems. Mm -hmm. So we've been found wanting in Ukraine, and we are very exposed right now, in Ukraine more so, and um, that's point one. We're, we're losing. Mm -hmm. David, I was going to ask you if, you know, we're kind of speaking about the idea that we might be able to change some of these outcomes if if we just did this or, or responded more aggressively, whatever whatever the case may be. However, you describe a lot of these cycles as unconscious cycles that that humans fall into. So is there even a point to really speaking about the things that could have changed the the course of what is coming or is it you know really a foregone conclusion all right let's let's take reduce it to the personal uh, humans all of us create habitual behaviors because they use less of our brain and save calories mm -hmm. <laughs> and those habits become life forming defining actions mm -hmm. and unconsciously we just keep doing them so at some stage, we decide that one of those is smoking, and we finally work out inside that not just intellectually that we might die from it. But now you've got to break. The first thing is to realize how bad the habit is, that you're not going to be the exception with respect to the bad input. Then to see the habit, that's 50% of it, and then to start making conscious choices to not smoke. That's how we evolve as individuals. And I see us as a human race as exactly the same. The difficulty is, is that very few people have pointed out the defense that essentially this and quantified a pattern to the point where others could believe it. And that's what my life's work has been about, is, is trying to explain to people just how unconscious this habitual process is that we have. It's also been able to distill where good and bad behavior exists and where options exist. So, for example, you know, how do you change where we are right now? If I could have a magic wand, what mechanism does David Murray do to two years earlier change the way we are? Well, my adaptation through lateralization program recognizes the fundamental paradigm of decline is linearization. Too many linear thinking leaders who fail to see what's coming over the horizon and create adaptive strategies. Mm -hmm. so it's no use coming up with a great strategy and giving it to a linear thinker because they'll just blow it. You've got to change your leadership into more lateral. So that's what wars do. Wars turn linear systems into lateralized, fully adaptive systems, which is also what creates this massive spurt of growth, I believe, after a war ends, which actually comes nine times out of ten. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would have done is promoted greater lateral leadership that had a sense of service, not like Trump who had a sense of self-service, because Trump is lateral, but he's completely psychologically unsuitable for the task. And because he served himself. So the, the next the next message is. Leadership is meant to serve the nation it leads, or the company, or whatever organization. That the leadership needs lateral strategic thinking, but it needs linear implementation in a combination, not one or the other. It's a symbiotic process. Once you've got that change, then you've got more fertile ground to say, did you know you're, we're in a repeating pattern? And then once you get fertile ground, you can talk about what the pattern looks like, the probabilities of the pattern playing out, and what could be different. And the third element is, Predators and dictators are one and the same. And all predators in society and in the animal kingdom basically will take a free option if they think they can eat you without risk. And they consider it more and more likely, unlikely, if you might kick them in the teeth and break your jaw 
and they have to be very, very, very desperate if you're bigger than them or equal in size. Lesson being deterrence works. Mm -hmm. And what deterrence means is is an ability to maintain your boundaries and integrity, not allow the infiltration we've had from Russia and China on an epic scale. It means having the military capability to know that your challenger is going to adapt with new weapons and you need to keep pace. And a great example of where that really worked was the Royal Navy, actually, into 1914, because of the revolutions in military affairs from the arrival of submarines and the arrival of the dreadnought to the super dreadnought to, you know, going from coal to basically oil fired, far more calorific power, centralized gunnery control. The Royal Navy pretty much led those evolutions and maintained not just a bigger fleet, but a fleet that sat at the edge of evolution. That was a great story. That was because Britain into 1914 was not, hadn't just entered it decline. It was above the declining stage in late overextension. But if you look at the American Navy, it's been incredibly slow adapting to the challenge of saturation missiles that are ballistically fired, that land on a carrier and hypersonic weapons. They just have watched it happen in slow motion, hanging on to an old paradigm. And that's because America is further down the empire curve to climb. And its institutions are far more linear than we would like to think they are than mm -hmm. maybe when Britain was into 1939, which is really alarming. And it explains why America is behaving so, so poorly in adapting to these problems. So is it possible that really America grew too large and ended up in some ways being too comfortable with the power that it was able to exert into the world that it has in a way some some hubris and and some you know, defaulted to this linear implementation of its power to face the new problems that we have in the world now. Look, it just followed the same evolutionary cycle as all the cycles before. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as American exceptionalism when it comes to its self-organization. It is exactly the same. And what's so interesting about it is, is, is often empires have different cultures and different locations. So you could imagine why it's hard for people to draw parallels. But in fact, the parallel between the British Empire, which was the first great maritime global power, and America, which designed its strategy to supplant us, is really similar. Same language, same heritage, same religious system, same oceans. And yet they most Americans think there's nothing to learn from the decline of the British Empire. Well, what's that got to do with them? And yet never has been never has been have there been a better parallel to learn from. Mm -hmm. And yet none of them have. Mm -hmm. And that's hubris on the most amazing scale. Mm -hmm. So, David, maybe it would be instructive to move on to, let's say, the Hamas-Israel conflict now and discuss a little bit about the intricacies as you see them from that side of things. So I think the, this, this war zone is very much a product of the stalemate in Ukraine, the, you know, the spread of the infection of war, which comes as this Kondratiev cycle comes into its peak and the, the entropic split of societies becoming more polarized and more willing to kill. Um, it is such a complicated overlay in the Middle East. So I'm gonna try and start about this and think about what is really going on. Mm -hmm. So the Middle East used to be controlled by the Ottoman Empire. At the end of the First World War, those nations predominantly went to Britain and one or two went to France. So the Middle East suddenly became under British control. And under British control, um, we were pro-Arabic. And at the same time, what happened with Germany by you know, this process of blaming the Jewish society, which I often think about, why do, why is it so easy for people to be anti-Semitic? And what are some of the consequences? Well, the one I really laugh about is the, the, the rise and the fall of the Spanish Empire. And really near the peak, they threw out 200,000 middle class Jews and the system never recovered. I mean, if there's a lesson in terms of how productive a group of people could be, well, and what happens when you extract them from your society, the lesson that Spain suffered should be all over everyone's fourth. So there's something interesting. They obviously have a very unique culture and they're also highly productive together, working together, they're very anti-entropic and they become wealthy and therefore they become the center of envy and they're different enough that therefore it's easy to say my envy can be defined by your difference and they've suffered from that, which, you know, 
is an appalling concept, but there are lots of other minorities which are not dissimilar. If you go across and you look at the Kurds, the Kurds have suffered a very similar fate as the Jews, but get absolutely no airtime. They're mm. scattered amongst Middle Eastern countries. They're persecuted. So it's not just about the Jews. It happens to other minorities with very definable cultures. So it, well, I think we should just put that on the table. The next thing that happened is that when we left Palestine, uh, as we did in the partition with India, obviously both sides, whether it was Muslim and Hindu in India, fought until they created borders and separateness. And they've had a couple of wars, but they've sort of accepted those borders since. But what happened with the, 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 the Zionists, and I do think there's a little chuckle here before the war, they sort of infiltrated their way into Palestine and the Arabs sold them you know, crappy marshlands that were worthless for huge amounts of money. And the industrious Zionists drained it and made it productive kibbutz. And they provided anchors for other immigrants to come in. So it was their greed that, that essentially gave away the first routes that allowed this infiltration of Zionism into what was an Arab Palestine. And, and then essentially, when the war started and Britain left, there was a new hegemon. And the new hegemon was America. And America basically supported the rise of, a, of an Israeli Zionist Israel. And Israel in the process became America's creation an island in the Middle East, in effect. And at that time, obviously, they had influence in Iran, prior to the Shah's revolution. And so think of Israel as one of the great sort of extensions of American power into another region. And we can conclude that if Israel implodes, the damage done to the American empire and the recognition of its failure is huge, as it was for us when we lost Suez. It's the end of your empire. So there's a lot at stake with Israel's existence. And then you've got this other process from then onwards. The Middle East became part of the proxy war of the Cold War. The Arabs were supported by the USSR and Israel was supported by the West. And all of those Arab-Israeli wars were proxies for a Cold War. Lo and behold, the Cold War ends and it moves more and more to a sort of peacetime paradigm, except something else is happening. The Middle East is rising up as a collective entity and Islamic identity is beginning to rise as the great piston of Amer the decline of the Western empires gave it space to move into it. And the first time it exerted itself was when the oil shock in 73 said, we've got power over you, and they used it when they could. And inside that is a civil war where the Shia Islam Iranian world, which is in many ways like a Protestant mindset, freer, more revolutionary, is challenging the status quo for who dominates the rise of this regional region area. Sunni powers, the main ones being the Turks and the Saudi Arabians, and now on the other side, you've got Iran. So you've got this, this regional struggle, you've got this injection of hegemony and importance of Israel, and you've got a proper hotpotch of a rising system effectively at war with itself, seeking its collective identity. And into that mist, you've got the dynamics where why don't the other Arab countries basically take all the people in the Gaza Strip and build them a city with the money from Saudi Arabia that wouldn't touch it, it cost them for a moment and stop the problem. Well, I came across some interesting sort of points where when the war was lost and if some of the Palestinians went to different places, 300,000 went to Jordan, didn't integrate, and in the end it was a civil war because of their militancy. Mm -hmm. So the reason why the Arabs don't want the Palestinians to be in their country and won't accept them is because there's a militancy which goes beyond just anti-Israeli. And that's, you know, and for example, you look at Egypt, they don't want the Muslim Brotherhood near them. You can, all these sides have different perspectives, but they don't favor an open arms that will save you from this. So, and then sadly, and this is, you know, you've got Iran after the American failures in Iraq, basically gaining more influence in, in the southern Shia zone and the middle parts of Iraq into Lebanon, creating proxies, and waiting for that moment when they were going to make their move with a move for atomic weapons and proxy action. And they had an interesting problem. How do you get more liberal Arab people to accept the draconian measures of the mullahs? You don't. So what you do is you have another meme, which was hate Israel, destroy Israel, come and join us. And that's what they've used to spread into the Sunni world when they have no common ground. So they've used hatred of Israel to bind their enemies together in an alliance, which has given them regional power. And then if you add back into it, you've had this ridiculous Obama concept of 
do a deal with them, stop the nuclear weapons to promote and break out, send them three Hercules full of cash. What do the Iranians do? Start a war in Yemen against South Saudi Arabia, which has killed tens of thousands we don't talk about. And there you've got Obama wanting to repeat the deal, sending the same signals of idiocy and stupid, stupid behavior just before they tried to create a rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And they weren't alert to the fact that Iran would have lost out enormously. So of course it's going to trigger some action that alienates Israel from the Arab world. And that's exactly what this was. It was an action designed to be the most heinous, most brutal, most appalling, knowing that you know Netanyahu was basically going to look like an idiot, would lash out like a strong man, over respond, look like he was inhumane by killing civilians, which is what they did in the first days until they got control themselves. But since then, I think they've been far more judicial than the liberal press actually portrays. Simply, if you look at the amount of ordnance they've dropped and you look at the population density, I'd understand how if they were doing it on purpose, designed to create destruction, there'll be 100,000 deaths rather than the 10,000, which are appalling to see. But still, there is there is there is fire discipline in the Israeli actions and they're fighting um, an organization that's pulling the civilian population over their heads, wanting them to die. Mm-hmm. And I feel so sorry for the population because you've got the Hamas leadership who want them to die because that's how they turn the rest of the Arab world against Israel. And you've got Israel who doesn't want to kill them, basically, because it knows it but, and is trying to be judicious but still can't stop it because of the complexity of the situation. Mm-hmm. And yet it's got an enemy that's entrenched and dangerous. And I think the thing that is, we call them a terrorist organization. I think that's wrong. Okay, we've got to remember that Gaza was under its own state control under Hamas government. It was a state that made an act of war against Israel. And it's not just a bunch of terrorists in your country. It's a separate state. And there's an act of war and there is war that continues in that process. And it's disgusting. It's horrible. And, you know, but why don't the Arab countries do more? Why aren't they willing to do more? It's already to con- condemn Israel. But there's only, there's two and a half million people that you could shunt out to Egypt, create, put them in camps, fund it with the Saudi Arabians. They're not doing that. Mm-hmm. They all have their own agendas. So it's everything that's terrible in humanity. But I can't see a way that it won't stop escalating because because essentially Iran didn't start this randomly. It started it with an outcome and it set traps. And the trap was basically civilians being killed, the mobilization of the Arab world against Israel, all of those dynamics, which I'm afraid have happened. So at the moment, Israel is reacting to the trap and it started to tread more carefully. I wrote in day three how dangerous it would have been to do certain things. And they held back, thank goodness, from doing those things. But it is escalatory, whatever happens. And I can't not see a case where Hezbollah is not engaged, where Iran doesn't actually flow into the process, and Iran doesn't try to become a nuclear power somewhere in this horrible mess, which means strikes on all the nuclear facilities and all the other consequences that roll from that. Mm-hmm. If this was happening in 2002, I would lay money would de-escalate because it's sort of part of the Kondratiev cycle that doesn't have as much entropy built into it. But because it's happening at a time of ultimate entropy, it's like bubble wrap. You just can't stop the damn thing. Mm-hmm. But what you need to do is display strength. And the one thing America did do that represented strength was send two carriers, one to deal with Hezbollah in the in the north and the other to make sure the strengths of them were policed. That was a typically American part of the playbook. But the problem with that is if Putin has given... You know, Hezbollah a Tuscon missile, or you know, Iran a couple of Tuscons. Those carriers are dead, mm-hmm. and they're in, you cannot defend against hypersonic cruise weapon systems. And if they are dead, then essentially the the whole system starts to go backwards. Imagine the lack of the hegemonic embarrassment that goes with losing a carrier to a single missile that's Russian provided, and they'll just say you provided the harpoons to kill a Moskova. Our turn. Mm-hmm. You know, David, all of this seems, as you say, with with this time of ultimate entropy here, this all seems to be building towards what you're calling the the 2025 kind of start of World War Three. So, is there is there another piece, perhaps China here, that is has yet to kind of add to this conflict puzzle? Absolutely. I mean, I think World War Three started with Ukraine, so we're in it. We're just, you know, pretending we're not. 
which is making it worse in terms of denial. And so, so now let's look at the, 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 the really the big daddy that's basically facilitated all these challenges to America. And, you know, and China set itself, I believe, in motion in 2020 with a Nazi four-year type plan, which was greater self-responsibility, um, stockpiling of resources, and a natural gap from export to consumer that couldn't fill it, which is why the economy is doing so badly. And the net result for Hitler was he had to be at war by 1940 or bust, hence 39 off he went. And China is no different. China is at the stage where if it doesn't act, it's going to go down financially. And she is in a position when he may be reticent because he wants all the, the dominoes in place to think he's going to win. But every hegemonic challenge requires a massive throw of the dice. It did in 1914. It did basically when they went through the Aden Forest and all the German army said, you know, mein Führer, it's not going to work. But he did. He rolled it. It did in many ways with Japan, with Pearl Harbor. And they did afterwards grab everything in sight and create a Middle Eastern, a, a Far Eastern Empire before it was captured, recaptured. So my point is not all the conditions are going to be in place when she has to move. But what's pushing him towards taking the risk is the economic four year plan, which is now near the end of the term. Mm -hmm. There are two other components. One is the advantage with hypersonic weapons and, and ballistic missiles with kill capabilities to carriers and ships, which basically the US Navy is doing everything it can to try and counter. And there's a window when that will be able to operate and a window when it will be ablated. And you know, let's just say that's a year if you're generous. And on top of that, if you are she studying the West, you have a perfect enemy you have the most incompetent, strategically hubristic, and arrogant, linear thinking people in terms of Biden and Jake Sullivan to go to war against. They've proven collectively inept time and time again, and your nightmare is replaced just by chance by someone who's more competent. And and so what what really, when you stack that up, it's a sort of go no go, and the window is much shorter than people think. And I think that window is it could be any time. My thesis is there will be no warning. The PLAN have built a, a system which is massive rocketry to destroy everything that moves. And essentially, from that position and doing everything that moves, essentially, you can remove the carrier groups, bases in Japan, push America out to the second island chain, and it can't get back in again. And that's when they consolidate an industrial base over a period of years and come out somewhere in year six or year seven with the biggest navy the world's ever seen, and they take the oceans one by one. This is not a quick fix. We, I think that if you go back to the hegemonic war in the Napoleonic era, it was 16 years. If you go back to the previous hegemonic war, it was actually 14 with a gap and ended in 45. That's 30 years. So I think we've probably got a decade long conflict, at least. This is not suddenly going to resolve because no side can truly win the whole war in one go. What you can do is start the algorithmic process of expanding of, you know, as Hitler did, you take you take Western Europe and then you go to Russia and they failed. But imagine if they got Russia and that algorithmic expansion means you get more land, more people, greater industrial base, more resources. You consolidate them, you harness them, and then you take on bigger enemies. So that's what China will be doing. It mm -hmm. won't seek to win instantly. It will just seek to go and occupy Japan, South Korea, take over the world shipbuilding, consolidate it, resource itself over land via Russia. And, and, you know, fight on the Eastern Front, which is now Ukraine, you know, try and expand it over the Pacific, but probably won't. And very quickly, these long range precision missiles. One of the things that's kind of interesting is that precision is king. But in an all out war, we don't have enough precision missiles to create decisive outcomes, to carry enough explosive to actually bring the other side to his knees. We don't have the thousand bomb array that we had in the Second World War, dropping thousands of pounds on, on your heads, destroying and leveling cities. Conventionally, we don't have that capability. So again, in a strange way, we've gone from civilian population totally at risk through conventional bombing, totally at risk through nuclear war, which I don't think is a ceiling that will be approached because each side wants to win and one way or the other and would survive. But we don't have the ability to basically change outcomes because we don't have millions of missiles. We have tens of hundreds of missiles, not enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very peculiar twist in war. It's almost a a sort of strange enough, it's a, a de-escalation that we haven't realized. So David, you just kind of brought up the idea of resources. And 
this global conflict that ends up, I think, ultimately being based around resources, right? So how does that really, all of these conflicts start to affect the commodity cycle and in turn, much of the the markets that we face and, and care about on a day-to-day basis? Here? So I'm going to turn that around. Okay. I, I don't think it's quite interesting. We're chicken or egg, which one causes the problem? Mm-hmm. And I think what causes the problem is this entropic cycle, which is like a massive heartbeat. And I don't know where it comes from. It's one of the mysteries I don't understand that pumps through the human system. And with it, you see inflation as a measure and commodity pricing, but really it's entropic energy surging through to reorder our human systems. And in that process, as you come to this last phase, conflict is part of it. And as you move as part of that, you see obviously movement in the commodity resource base. You then see conflict. And within these big conflicts, you see constriction. And the best example of constriction is the Battle of the Atlantic in both World War I and World War II. And if you go and look at where the peak surged in the commodity cycle in World War I, it was the peak of the U-boat success before convoys were brought in in 1917. Mm-hmm. That was actually the peak. And once the convoy system came in and supplies flowed through, the peak started to ebb. And similarly, if you go and look at the Second World War, one of the peaks, because there were a number of them actually, much softer cycles, because although the Second World War was bigger, it wasn't at the same stage of the Kondratiev cycle. 1914 to 18 was at the peak. And actually, the other one was on the declining sources into 50, and it was a secondary peak. So the completely different behaviors, actually, which I fascinated me. Going back to this underlying surge actually decides what goes on. And then you end up with constriction, and then you end up with surges. And so I would look to be constriction, ultimately, of supply chains to be the thing that drives our commodity prices through the roof in ways we can't imagine. Mm-hmm. And we're already seeing signs of it. We've seen attempted constriction in the Black Sea, attempted constriction through Putin, the manipulation. It's all part of the process. Mm -hmm. Well, that really kind of, to me, points to the idea that constricting the oil market, or at least the movement of energy, will very likely be one of the obvious key points here to really understand and understand the outcome of a lot of these issues, right? Because right. ultimately, of course, energy ends up being life. So how does the oil price really end up being the the heartbeat of a lot of these conflicts? Well, energy actually is the heartbeat of our civilization. Mm-hmm. And as we've generated more, more calories per kilogram, we've been able to build bigger civilizations. So you take away the flow of energy and you take away the basic lifeblood of a civilization. Mm -hmm. And as two civilizations clash, you can imagine they need energy and denuding the other side of their energy is a viable strategy. So I think that that enough is enough to explain kind of the dynamics. They didn't have energy in the way in in the Napoleonic Wars, but they certainly had it in the Second World War, First World War, in in the constriction of flow of resources through coal. And I found something that really amazed me because I've created a a unique study of World War I and World War II and how financial markets behave versus conflict. Mm-hmm. And then so created the strategy for World War III for my top level investors. And it's very cool because it shows certain patterns in ways that I've never seen presented anywhere else. One of the things I unveiled that surprised me was in the early stages of the First World War, essentially there were neutral countries. There were the Nordics and there was Holland. And basically, they traded with Germany, especially across the Baltic or Holland over land. And they provided numerous war materials, which basically countered the effects of the loose blockade enacted by the Royal Navy. And lo and behold, who provided the coal for those countries? Britain. So there was Britain providing the coal for neutral countries that fed the war machine of their enemy. Now, that's exactly what's been happening with Russia. We buy their gas, which feeds the enemy we fight. And that really intrigued me that it isn't just our stupidity. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion is that these hegemonic wars are preceded by economic entanglement. And economic time is so great that no one can stop and pull it, stop it immediately or risk their economy in some way. So the, the tentacles get pulled out gradually. And by 17, there was none of it. The blockade was total. 
and you're seeing that gradual process. But it's an interesting thing that what we see with Russian gas happened in 1914 and 15 onwards with the neutral countries, and Britain was doing the same thing. So again, it's a fascinating example of actually how sometimes quite precisely these patterns manage to repeat themselves. I, when I find them, I just fall off my chair sometimes that no one talks about it, no one refers to it, and no one sees it as relevant as a lesson. So from there, can, can we talk a little bit about how you see, let's say, th this commodity cycle? Is it going to be mostly concentrated, let's say, the inflation that we're going to see mostly driven by the oil price? Are there certain you know, pieces of this commodity complex that should be separated out and spoken about differently? How do you see that entire, this drive for, let's say, the, this next decade of conflict as you described it? For, for, for those of you listening, you know, and saying, well, how realistic from this David on drugs or whatever, <laughs> I'd say simply just watch the oil price. If the oil price starts to go down, then you can see the world has been de-escalating. The oil price starts to go up, you should start to go, oh, remember what he said? Oh, my goodness. So oil price, and, and, it, and it sits right, I think, at a point where we should see it start to move, really move. Mm -hmm. um, gas is the same. And so in your portfolio, gas looks to me like it's coiled, ready for a whopping great move. You know, it's up around sort of 3, 6, 3.6. Easily, it's going to go to 10. And if it does what I think, it'll go to 20 or 30 in the States, let alone European gas, which is more premium. And then uranium actually has been out of oil, stronger than any of them. So looking at those three commodities, so far they're set up for continuation and acceleration. If they reverse or show massive weakness, what that means is the geopolitical tensions have de-escalated and the demand dynamics have basically come into play and we are shrinking with inflation in terms of real terms. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's how I see that part. But there's some other complexities here, which I think are really interesting. Um, in my analysis, if you to look at America in its empire curve and where it is, essentially, it's much weaker than Britain as it entered into 1914. And Britain was bust by 1917, and it needed the deep reserve of America to basically keep it fighting. Mm -hmm. Into 1939, in decline, but still the biggest it had been, having absorbed the Middle East. And we lasted until 1940. In 1941, we would have gone bust without massive American help. Um, and of course, at each stage when we asked for help, our wealth shifted into American wealth. So the American empire is weaker, I believe, with its debt dynamics. Its debt to GDP ratio is now the same as it was at the peak of World War II. That's a staggering number. We're about to start or in this war, and the US debt dynamics are equal GDP. That's terrifying. Mm. I mean, scary. And so it shows you how fragile the system is, because what happens was two. Let's say there's, from here, we managed to de-escalate all the hot points and we go to super Cold War II, massive arms race. America has to spend much more on defense to keep up with its uh, challenges. Where do you get that from? Debt. Whoops, that's expensive uh, and unsustainable where we are. And the other one is you go into conflict and your, cost, your war costs go absolutely bananas. And the first thing that all the bond markets did in both wars was fall, because you understand greater issuance is coming, along with the equities falling too. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those two, the moment you get conflict, you get inflation because you get basically rate increases because the cost of money increases. And with that, constriction. So they're all wrapped into one loop. And I keep thinking about the peak in 75. In the US, it was 15% 10-year rates, 22% Fed funds, and 15% CPI. I can't see how this peak doesn't equal that peak. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can't see how this peak doesn't quantumly exceed that peak. Mm -hmm. So then you go and look at the rate interest rate behavior that took place at the bottom of 2000, which was the beginning of the new cycle. So you, you probably would have a five-year lag. You should have seen rates basically turning around 2005. And we should roughly be, if you look at the same part, at 8 to 10%. Mm -hmm. But we didn't. We carried on basically having lower rates, and that came through the export of our industrial base to China, which reduced global inflation and let these yields sit there and sit there and only move in 2020. Mm -hmm. So I keep thinking about the game of catch-up, where you should be at 10, and even now we're not even close, 10-year rates and nowhere near that. Mm 
And what we're going to see is this massive surge, which is almost a straight line because we should be so much higher. Mm -hmm. So I think a bond shock, a funding shock is really big. Obviously, inflation triggers that, but also so does war. There's 20,000 ways this circle, but they're all interlinked. And so that means bonds aren't a safe haven. Generic equities aren't a safe haven. Some are, you know, things like steel producers, miners are fantastic, defense stocks, all I think possible, as long as they're subhorned to the wartime economy funded by the government when they try and reorganize themselves. But everything else is just not going not to be nice. Mm -hmm. And precious metals, obviously, a safe haven. The energy is first. And normally what you see is energy first, metal second, and agriculture third. So think of that cascade. We certainly saw that from 2000 in the early stages. Mm -hmm. So think of the layering in of how you risk it. Energy directly links to soft commodities because it takes energy to produce some transport, run tractors. The diesel correlation is just very high. Yeah. And things like nickel and copper, well, you need copper to make shells. And you know, this war is going to need a lot of shells. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the shell crisis in 1915, which I wrote about early in the Ukraine cycle and warned people that we were going to have a massive shell crisis. We're having a shell crisis. Mm -hmm. And to what extent the Ukrainians couldn't prosecute their um, their offensive this summer, you have to wonder what level of artillery shells. There are all sorts of accounts of guys going to museums and pulling out World War II pieces because they didn't have the ones they needed. Uh, wow. I suspect it's all been dampened down by, you know, artillery wasn't used to its end capability because ammunition's running out. Mm -hmm. So we've got a real, again, all this has happened before. It's a transition between peacetime mindset, wartime mindset. Mm -hmm. But it'll be a little longer because the tooling of the industrial base and the complexity of weapons means you can't just turn them around in a year. So it will be a slower burn in that respect. Mm -hmm. But it will build, inevitably. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, David, it's interesting that you brought up the idea of the of the bond market. And that was something that really baffled me in my, let's say, my economics journey was understanding the bond market and how it all ties together. So, you know, I've gained enough knowledge now to feel more of an understanding, but I wanted to discuss with you, let's say this recent sell-off of U.S. treasuries being held by China. So what is the larger implication there of that action? Do you think that they're, in a way, they're seeing this, this drop in bond value and they're trying to get ahead of that? They've been trying to get ahead of it for a while. They've had a really big, they've really found it hard to get out. Mm -hmm. And as a percentage of um, the overall US debt, their holdings have been shrinking, not because they've got it out, but because America's issued more debt. Mm -hmm. So, and, and if, if you're an enemy poised and waiting to strike, and this is the interesting thing, then why would you leave your money that you desperately need to fund your and support your own economy stuck in your enemy's hands? That's then going to be as it was for Russia. I was just going to say, it, exactly. Russia being a perfect example of that. Exactly right. So so the Chinese know that. And what's interesting is you can see that, first of all, their Belt and Road initiatives have dried up. Mm -hmm. And the reason behind that is, if you look, it's the ones they can't protect that are dried up, not the ones that they see in terms of the Asian links to other Asian countries. It's basically the ones to Africa, oversee at the moment they strike and go to war that they can't maintain because the US Navy will interdict them. And so we in the West need to work out, like wake up, anyone who's got an interest in China is better off taking their fingernail out rather than losing everything. And one of the companies which is super exposed is Apple. I mean, they make so many of their phones there. Companies which, you know, at the top end of the technology scale, many are very vulnerable. And Align had the same issue when it couldn't sell chips recently. So bifurcation in that space is coming head on. And anyone that thinks that they're going to survive with anything of an investment in China as a Westerner somehow must have some very heavy rose-colored glasses because the writing has been on the wall. It's something we've been warning about for years, years that it end this way. And it's going to end. And but the same way, the Chinese have a lot of investment in Britain, Europe, and America. It will all go the same way of Russian investment in our economies. It will be it will be reverted to the government for a war effort. Mm -hmm. David, how do you see, let's say, the issues that China faces? You know, I had a, a conversation the other day where we touched on the demographic problem that China has. You know, we've heard mutterings here and there about the credit problems that they're now facing. So does that stand 
somewhat opposed to the strength that they display in other areas? Um, let's start with demographics, which is a prime systems energy. The problem for China is it, I think it rebooted in the Boxer Revolution in the self-identity of being Chinese, the rejection of Western values. It obviously expanded in a higgledy-piggledy way. It went through regionalization until the civil war, which the communists won. It, and then this is and this is news for your peaceniks out there. And then it started to go to war with everyone it could. Typical of any organization that had been through a middle, its, its own civil war and militarized and sought to expand. And that sort of peaked into 75 when it got to everyone, went to war with Vietnam, you name it, it went to war with them. And the thing that then stopped it is as America started to win the Cold War, as the commodity cycle came off the peak and a consumer society started to get control of its economy, conversely, inflation started to increase in the producer of, of commodities, Russia, and the whole economic balance tipped. And so by the time Reagan came, there was enough money to spend money on weapons to innovate. And that created this really huge ceiling where China couldn't get out of its prison, and its prison was American power. And accumulated ultimately with the 1996 Taiwan Straits crisis, where China was trying to go for Taiwan, and America drove two carriers and a mew through the gap and said, don't you dare. And that begat the process of essentially, okay, we're going to covertly get you to invest in us, build an industrial base, compete with you that way, covertly, until we're strong enough to come back overtly. But the problem with all of that is the real time when the China should have been challenging on its own trajectory is 75 to 90. That's when it had the most energy to do it, mm -hmm. if it wasn't glass ceiling. And so really it's become a very, instead of a young 20 year old waiting to go out and punch everyone's lights out, it's more like a 65 year old. And you know, it's big, it's got lots of resource, but it's getting old. So the demographic drop off means that she understands if China is to become the preeminent power in the world, it's got to go now. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The next thing that is important in, in terms of the process is they have in in sort of trying to make their economy more war integral and more independent, they've cut the export chains and hoping the internal demand system would fill the gap. And there's been a gap and the gaps catered lack of economic productivity. It's exposed a huge leverage in the system. All of the things that mean that they're in a shit or bus mode and they're in a, in a democratic shit or bus mode. So for Xi's mindset, it's a now or never moment. Mm -hmm. If China doesn't make its move in the next few years, It'll never do it. And I think she has set his whole life on making China the preeminent dominant power because to the Communist Party, the idea of democracy is like a virus. They cannot coexist with it. Mm -hmm. They have to eradicate it. And they've created tools for social engineering with their own population, the Ouija's and in Hong Kong, to subdue hostile populations. So they actually believe that if you take a country, they can dominate it. And I think they can too. Mm -hmm. And I think we in the West, you know, face a form of eradication and there is no coexistence. David, all of these conflicts that we're bringing up really kind of brings up the idea to me of trying to, you know, have the people to fight all of these wars. So do you think that we're going to enter a new era of conscription to bring these populations back to fight these wars? I think the scale of this conflict, as it builds momentum, will wrap around the globe. The evolution of disputes. So again, I think the patterns of previous wars are informative. The pattern of the Napoleonic War was it was global from India to America until Britain got control of the sea lanes and, and compressed the Napoleonic system to just the continent. And then it besieged it. That's exactly what happened in the First World War. The challenges that took place in various places were constricted to the point where what was left was a siege of Europe and on the Western Front. That didn't happen quite the same way in the Second World War. It did happen in terms of, you know, the sea lanes, except for the Atlantic was always a battle zone. It never stopped being a battle zone. Mm -hmm. But Hitler got around it by going further east and building a bigger continental system, but he still didn't integrate it sufficiently in a way that was clever to make it super strong, and it fell down. I think what you're looking at is a version that will wrap the globe. It'll start off with the Russian, Chinese, out of the second island chain, continental power on a scale we've never seen continental power. And 
Iran will will lose as a regional power. Then we'll end up with you know some kind of eastern front around Ukraine where North Koreans and Chinese are fighting with Russians, which you know will, will occupy us enormously. Meanwhile, the Chinese are going to build the biggest navy the world's ever seen, and one day they're going to bring out a thousand ships and they're going to pick continent off by continent, and we're not going to be able to match it. That's the prognosis unless we innovate and change. So I don't see there's a place to hide. There's a place where you won't get hit initially, but ultimately, unless we push back this threat, deter it and counter it, it'll be everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the penultimate battle between democracy or autocracy, like collective thought processes that are individualistic or hierarchy. It's it's an evolution of the human system. It's way more than just countries. It's it distilled into that battle. Mm -hmm. And it's taking place when democracy is old and at its weakest. So, you know, at our strongest, we would be much more able to resist this. But we really are in the terminal phase, mm -hmm. which makes us so vulnerable, even though we have so many advantages. We've given many away despite being in the declining phase of our cycle. So the thing that's really important is, can we artificially re-stimulate ourselves? Can we get a defibrillator and go, Western world, wake up? And I argue that lateralization and adaptation are the answers to that. The mm -hmm. conscious promotion of lateral thinkers on a much faster scale than you would before conflict and certainly in conflict mm -hmm. to make a difference. And I see so many of my clients and the people that come to me being lateral thinkers and bit by bit, they're working their way through the system, doing amazing things, but there aren't enough of them at the moment until the linear leaders, the linear leaders are going to hold on to power right the way until we hit the brick wall. They're not smart enough to say, oh my goodness. And a good example was Chamberlain. And Chamberlain only lost power when Norway was a disaster. You just hope that disaster leaves something to, 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 to grow from and isn't too great. That's the risk in this modern day and age. But making people more aware of this differentiation. And ultimately, it's not domination of one or the other. Well, linear people tend to dominate natural people, funny enough. Natural people tend to actually symbiotic work with linear people because they integrate better in their strategic vision. We need far more lateralization in the West and we need to embrace. And those people are lateral need to work together because they're naturally lone wolves used to working alone. And actually they need to cluster together to create influence groups to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And then they, not, they can't be arrogant when they get hold of that power and say, well, you screwed it up and I'm going to do better. They've actually got to be smart enough to then integrate implementation strategies with linear people who can do details. Mm -hmm. So it's a mindful process. But I've seen it work. I was involved with a military organization that was formed on a large scale that we introduced this idea to. And it was quite fascinating how quickly people were walking through the hall saying, you're linear, I'm lateral, you do that, I'll do this. And it's turned out to be one of the most amazing fighting formations created in the past 10 years, mm -hmm. the past decade as a result of that recognition of skill sets. Well, you know, I was thinking earlier, for those that are interested in more of a conversation of lateral versus linear thinking, I would refer people back to one of our previous conversations as, as you and I discussed it at length. And I'll, I'll put the link to that show in the show notes. But David, is there is there anything else that we didn't go over that that is on your mind today? Um. I think it's a great idea, by the way, because that was a great pod. Um, yeah, there is. Look, there is. This is a very, very scary time. And my heart goes out to Jews in Western society that feel intimidated by what they're seeing, something none of us should should accept, mm -hmm. allow, or do anything but support minorities that deserve to have freedom in our society. And I think it goes back to the playground, bullying in any shape or form cannot be tolerated in our society. And too many people watch bullies and don't stand up to them. So it's about everyone turning around and calling a bully a bully. Mm -hmm. And when it's seen, call it out. Um, and we need to do that because the fractions within our society are not the things going to bring us down. We're now at the stage where the enemy's at the gates and we're still in denial that the enemy even exists. Mm -hmm. And like, all of this is scary, but it has happened before. Um, democracies have survived uh, i just hope the initial blow isn't so great that it, we fall over and i think at the moment however bad it will be we will still be there in a recovery and a fight back mode 
And it's about having the courage to realize our ancestors have been through this. We've made all the same mistakes, got ourselves into the same mess. We need to address that at some stage to be more aware so that it never happens again. Looking forwards, where do I think this great struggle between democracy and autocracy and hierarchy resolves itself? Ultimately, I think autocracy will lose. It will lose for the very simple process that conflict is the ultimate mechanism of adaptation. And with far more adapting nodes with a society full of lateral thinkers, you're far more likely in a sustained conflict to find a very unique outcome that pulls the enemy down. Mm -hmm. I often think about how adaptive Britain was even in the Second World War, the Dam Busters raid, the Tall Boys, and think about the Funnies, for example, which were Hobart's funny tanks that got us off the beaches against the impediments of minefields and obstacles and pillboxes, which the, which the Americans laughed at mm -hmm. and paid an enormous price for on Omaha. Um, and so that level of ad adaptability can make an enormous difference. And although there is adaptability in the Chinese system, just like all autocracies, it will be slower to implement, slower to move. And I think when we finally mobilize with more lateralization, that's our key to success. But we've got to have industrial bases. We've got to get people in like Beaverbrook that change the way our systems work to be more productive. We can't afford to have an NHS in this country that sucks the life dry and doesn't work. Inefficiency in any agency of any part of our economy has to be removed for us to lean ourselves down everywhere in the West to focus on the threat ahead. Mm -hmm. and in that process, we might well rebirth democracy in a much more global, vital form, because every time we've been through one of these hegemonic conflicts, we have produced a better world, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. And that's the good news. The trick is, We've got ourselves into the beginning of the bad news and we need to have courage and the quicker we face it the quicker we demand of our politicians they wake up and look for example in america anyone that supports a republican that is trying to constrain the funding for ukraine might as well sit themselves on their own landmine because the idea that you let putin win over ukraine over what is 100 billion which is a just teeny amount of money basically means that putin is then going to come ultimately with she for America, just guarantees it. So you know, if you wish to be self-sabotaging, if you wish to smoke yourself to bed, sit on a landmine, support those members of the house. But if you wish your children to flourish, think again. Well, David, it's a, that's an interesting kind of conclusion to, to our conversation today. And, you know, I think it just brings us back to the idea that we must think more long-term as a lot of these Eastern countries are and really try to figure out what the next domino pieces are to fall based on, let's say, these current actions. And, and I really appreciate you coming on to help shed some light on a lot of those ideas. Of course, for, for anybody that wants to find more of your work on Twitter at Global Forecaster and David Murrin, two R's. M U R R I N dot C O dot UK, where you do a ton of writing, market analysis, all kinds of different pieces of the puzzle that really help illuminate a lot of this. And David, I want to thank you again for your time today. Thanks, Tom. It's been a great pleasure as usual. And I think you just put, put your finger on it. We need far more strategic thinking in our society in every aspect, from government to the military to organizations to our own individual lives that then demand more of our politicians. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the privilege to talk to you. Share it with your listeners. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks, Tom. Until next time. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.